I will call Pastor Paul, he's the one who share with us the word of God today. Praise the Lord, amen. Bless the Lord. Let's just bow in prayer. Lord Jesus, hallelujah. Lord, we knew, know you are God, hallelujah. We know you are great, hallelujah. Lord Jesus, open up to us the word today, Lord, hallelujah. Lord, for, for it is true, it is rich, it is powerful. It is a thing that sustains us, Lord. It is a thing that created everything. Come to us now and speak to us, Lord. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. I've entitled this message, Asaph and the House of God. Asaph and the House of God. It's interesting, this, in First Peter chapter 1.21 it says, For prophecy came not of old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And so a certain number of people have been selected to write down scripture. And if you go through the scriptures, about 40 are named. So a, 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 several billion probably lived and died by the time John died. And only 40 of those billion were selected to actually write down the words of our Lord. And Asaph was one of those 40 people. So anybody that's been used is to write scripture is a very important person. And it's interesting, if you look in Psalms, at the top of each psalm you'll see some small writing, and unfortunately sometimes that great truth is lost in the, in the fine print. And quite often in that fine print you'll see who was the author of the psalm. A lot of people feel that David wrote all the Psalms, and this just isn't true. David wrote quite a large number of them, but there was Asaph and Solomon, Ethan and Heman are named as authors of the Psalms. Asaph was inspired to write more of the Bible than Peter, James, Jude, Jonah, Amos, Micah, Joel, Malachi, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, Nahum, and Obadiah. <coughs> Yet Bible commentators have missed him is one that was inspired by the Spirit to record such a large volume of scripture. Asaph was our witness to the construction of Solomon's temple. Who was he? The word Asaph means God has gathered. Asaph wrote Psalm 50 and 73 to 83 as 12 and perhaps also Psalm 94 making 13. But you'll see when you read Psalms, the Psalm of Asaph, the Psalm of David. So he wrote a, a great volume of scripture and yet this man has been missed probably because he was under all these other great men like David and Solomon and Rehoboam and all these. And, and sometimes the, 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 the righteous leader working under the unrighteous leaders sometimes get missed because of all the, all the things that are going on. His name either directly referring to him or his sons is cited 44 times in the Old Testament. Asaph lived from about 1020 to 920 BC, so he lived about 100 years. And there's a few people in Scripture that lived 100 or more that wrote Scripture, or three of them. One was John, he lived about 97 to 100 when he wrote Revelation. And some people feel that the last part of the Bible that was written was the, the last chapter of the Gospel of John. So that was written at the end. So the Gospel of John was written last, not, not in the order they appear in Scripture. And Moses was about 120 when he wrote Deuteronomy. So, so God you can use young people, he can use old people. And, and great wisdom can be used in people of this age. We know that he lived in Jerusalem. We know that he worked as the director of music for, at David's tent meeting before they built the temple. And he also worked as a song leader in Solomon's temple. Asaph was a young priest from the tribe of Levi. When David brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem in about 1000 to 995 BC, his father, Berechiah, was appointed doorkeeper of the Ark. Asaph was also was so talented that David put him in charge of music before the Ark of the Covenant. He was assisted by his brother Zechariah, who was probably in his 20s when he was appointed to this position and kept at least under the dedication of the temple almost 40 years later. So he had still may have also been ministering after that, but the scriptures don't report too much about him from that time on. That means he was an eyewitness to the United Kingdom, that is, under David and Solomon, 
He saw David's fall because of his sin with Bathsheba and the slaying of Uriah the Hittite. The problems of the household of Amnon and Tamar and the subsequent up, sorry, uprising of Absalom and David's restoration. He saw David amass the material for the proposed tabernacle and temple. David's death and Solomon anointed the next king. He also witnessed the construction of the magnificent temple. In Psalm 78 verse 60, Asaph has this to say, So that he, God, forsook, forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent which was placed amongst men, and chose the tribe of Judah, in verse 68, the Mount Zion, which he loved. And he built his sanctuary like high palaces, like the earth which he had established forever. So here, Asaph is talking about God moving the centre of worship from the tabernacle to, to the temple. So he was eyewitness to this and he's, he's logging this in his Psalms. In 2 Chronicles 3 and verse 1 it says, Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem in Mount Moriah, where the Lord appeared unto David his father in the place that David had prepared in the fleshing floor of Onan the Jebusite. So we know about David buying this land. He was offered to be given it, but David purchased it. It was also on Mount Moriah that Abraham offered up Isaac. So this is so the temple was actually built at the place where Abraham offered up Isaac. So here we have God setting aside this holy place from the time of Abraham to now. This description in Kings and Chronicles are not prescriptive enough to fully know what it looked like. There is a detailed description of Ezekiel's temple and a brief, brief description in Revelation of a temple. There was a temple scroll found by the Bedouin tribesmen in the Dead Sea Scrolls and, and it was opened up and translated after about 1961 and there was a temple described in that. Now, we don't know where they got all the information for this but the detail is very, very explicit. So, based on this and other people's idea, will give you an idea of what the temple looked like. Asaph was one of the priests during the dedication of the temple to the get together with his son. So if we can look at the PowerPoint presentation. It's all about separation. So the first wall is the separation from the world. Just as like the tabernacle had occurred all the way around. But in this case here there's five levels of separation. If you can go to the next slide. So we have each one of these, the temple scroll named which gate was allocated to which tribe. This was the east side, that's the west side. The most important gate is the east side gate, so Levi was given the most important gate. And again, Levi could walk straight into the temple through these gates, through these gates, through these gates, and through these gates. So we have five levels of separation. So you've got people coming from the world to be separated from worlds. So the outer court, the men, women, children and Gentiles got into this, this section. And so this temple is all about fellowship. So it's all about yards and yards of space for people to fellowship. And then the, then the second level of separation called the middle court, I mean the men, men, the men of Israel got into it. And then there's the inner court, if we could go to the next slide. So, so as we show this, was the men of Israel only, and then the the inner court, which was the priests and lay gods. And then there was the holy place, which only priests, certain priests by lot could go. And then there was the high priest could go into the holiest of holy once a year. So there was five levels of separation. And that's, that's apart from everything else, that's probably the most important aspect of understanding what God was trying to do when he set up temple worship, is to understand that he wanted people sanctified when he came to worship him. We go to the next slide, please. So, so here's a depiction of, of the inner court. So we've got the, the temple proper and the separation and only, only four gates into the inner, inner court. I don't want to go into all the details of all this. If we could just go to the next slide. And so here we have, have the labour and the slaughter place and the holy place and the holiest of holies. We, we could go into all this detail, but it's just... This is what Asaph witnessed. This is building the house of God. This was the house of God that Solomon built. And this is what they believe. It looks something like this. If we could go to the next slide. So the temple itself looked like this. And this was the, 
the giant waiver. I don't know if God was happy that they used Paul to support it on, but that's just the way they built it. And there's the door to the temple, if you go into the next slide. So it looked something like that. So there was a court, and then the holy place, and then the holiest of holies, and that's where the Ark of the Covenant was. And, and here, of course, that you had to wash, and then there was a showbread and, and the golden candlestick if you'd go to the next slide. So it would have looked something like that, very magnificent, and that's where the priests worship. So they had many, many, many bread tables of showbread and many, many lamps because this was the light of the world. So in the ark, in the tabernacle, they only had one of each, but in the temple they had a multitude of them. If you go to the next slide. So this is just entering into just in front of the main curtain, and there was only one offer of incense before the before the curtain, and then if you just go to the last slide. And that's the Ark of the Covenant. So the whole whole point of the temple was to hold this Ark of the Covenant. And God dwelt between the, the two cherubs. Thank you. So, in Second Chronicles 5 verse 7 it says, And the priest brought in the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord into his place, to the oracle of the house, to the most holy place, even under the wings of the cherubim. So they made two giant cherubs in the sides of the holiest holies, and then they put the Ark of the Covenant there. For the cherubim spread forth their wings over the place of the Ark, and the cherubim covered the Ark and the staves thereof above. And they drew out the staves of the Ark, and the ends of the staves was, were seen from the Ark before the oracle. But they were not seen without, as though it is unto this day. So up until then, they were never ever pull the staves out of the Ark. The Ark of the Covenant was always ready to be moved. But now this is this is a time that it meant that it could stay there forever. There was nothing in the ark in, in Second Chronicles 5:10. There was nothing in the ark save two tables which Moses put at Horeb when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. The ark of the covenant overlaid with gold ram and with a pot of gold of manna and Aaron's rod that budded was also put in the ark, but they. They must have been taken when it was captured by the by the people at the time of the Eli. So they opened it and then they got plagued and they had to give the ark back if you remember the story. So originally there was Aaron's rod that budded, there was a golden pot of manna and there was the, the Ten Commandments on two tablets of stone. But when they came to the Ark of the Covenant then the other two had been removed when, when it was captured by the, the Philistines. Although Solomon had built the temple, its main purpose was to house this Ark of the Covenant. And the last reference, this, and the last reference to it was, is in Jeremiah 3.16. So we don't really know what happened to it from uh, after it was put in Solomon's temple because the temple was conquered a number of times. And it came to pass when the priests in 2 Chronicles 5.11 and it came to pass when the priests would come out of the holy place for all the priests that were present were sanctified and did Wait by course. So the Levites, which were the singers, and all of them of Asaph, and of Heman, and Jephthah, with the sons of their brethren, being arrayed in white linen, having cymbals and psalteries and harps, stood at the east end of the altar, and with them an hundred and twenty priests sounding with trumpets. And it came to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one, they made one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they had lifted up the voice with the trumpets and the cymbals and the instruments of music, and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever, that then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. And so here we have the dedication of the temple. And this was actually a precursor of the day of Pentecost and the 120 trumpeters representing the 120 people that would be filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. And it also says they were playing with one accord and it says in the upper room they were all with one accord in one place. So, so unity and, and holding things together is what God is all about here. And so Asaph was one of these people of this dedication. So this was the crowning point of of Solomon's ministry and Solomon's life and Solomon as, as ruler. After Solomon's dedication of the temple, Asaph saw Israel's golden age turn into something quite apart from what he'd expected. After a promising beginning, Solomon turned his back on God to pursue power, wealth, luxury, 
human wisdom, as well as the worship of idols. And marrying 700 wives and 300 concubines, I think he began to lose his, lose his wisdom. But the women taught him to, to, to worship other gods. In order to finance these pursuits, the people were pressed with slavery and taxes. As they saw Solomon become a wicked man, and who entrusted the administration to his kingdom to other wicked men, it was so upsetting to this righteous leader when, when the above, those above him, became so corrupt. After Solomon's death, Asaph was a very old man. He saw David's kingdom torn in two by God's decree. So God let the kingdom, United Kingdom, remain under Solomon, but he said, because you worship the gods of your wives and allowed the gods of the wives that you made to be gods, and they're saying your, your kingdom is going to be divided. So God decreed this. So Paul Asaph, having seen all this, having seen this magnificent temple dedicated, he, he found that everything was falling apart. So when Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, took over, the kingdom divided and the, and the ten tribes went away. And Asaph saw this happen. And so, as you read the Psalms of Asaph, you will see how much the Psalms speak of the events of the life and times in relation to the temple. Psalm 73 reflects Asaph's bitterness at the murder of his brother. That's the one Jesus referred to, that the Zechariah that was slain between the altar and the temple. That was Asaph's brother. It is also as much needed commentary on what happened in Israel at the years between the dedication of the temple and the end of Solomon's reign. In the narration of Kings and Chronicles, this period is almost blank, but Psalms 82 and 75 reflect Asaph's disillusionment with Solomon and realisation that Solomon was not the Prince of Peace that was to come. Psalm 76 and 80 reflect Asaph's pain during the division of Solomon's kingdom when Rehoboam took Judah and Benjamin and Jeremiah took the other ten tribes away. Psalm 74 and 79 reflect Asaph's distress at the innovation of, innovation of, invasion of Shishak, the king of Egypt, and the destruction of the temple. So when we were studying the house up in 2 Samuel 7, it said, if the kings become wicked, then I will, I will chasten you with, with the sons of men. And that's exactly what happened. Because they started to introduce idols into the land and do all these things, then then Shishak, the king of Egypt, came and burnt the temple. So this temple that he was there to see the, the glory come down, he could not minister because of the glory of God in his lifetime. It was burnt by a heathen king. And so it must have been such a, a shock to him. In 1st 2nd Chronicles 12, 5 it says, Then came Shem, Shem Aiah, the prophet to Rehoboam, and to the princes of Judah, that were gathered together to Jerusalem because of Shishak, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, You have forsaken me, therefore have I also left you in the hands of Shishak. So Shishak the king of Egypt came up against Jerusalem, and took away the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king's house, and took all, and carried away also the shields of gold which Solomon had made. And so here we have all this happening while he witnessed the, the building of the house of the Lord and then, and then Shishet coming and burning it and taking all these things away. In Psalm 74 verse 7, Asaph said, They have cast fire into your sanctuary. They have, def they have defiled by casting down the dwelling place of the name to the ground. In Psalm 79 verse 1, the psalm of Asaph, O God, the heathen are come into your inheritance, your holy temple they have defiled. Yet they lay Jerusalem on heaps, and in verse 79, verse 7, and they have devoured Jacob and laid waste his dwelling place. So here, here is Asaph in his son describing the building of the house of the Lord and then its destruction under, under this Egyptian king. If ever you want to start now that I've, I've brought your attention to this and the Psalms of Asaph and how important they are. Before the destruction of the temple, Asaph had an insight into the experience of worshipping the temple. So in Psalm 73, it talks about, I saw, I saw the, the wicked, and, and, and Pastor Freddie was preaching on this not long ago, he said, the wicked seem to be able to do things that us righteous people just don't seem to do, and they seem to get all these things just happening all for them, and nothing ever seems to happen for us. And, and Asaph, mooted this very point in Psalm 73, said, their eyes stand with fatness and their tongues walk through the earth and, and everybody just thinks they're wonderful and they've got so much money and nothing ever happens for them. Here I'm trying to be righteous and nothing happens for me and I'm praying and I'm 
chastising my body and trying to be holy and nothing's happening for me. And so I sort of had this, this dilemma that, uh, and he was probably thinking about Solomon with all his fabulous wealth doing all this and all these other people there. Their eyes standing out with fatness as he, as he describes the, the covetous nature of, of people when they amass wealth unto themselves. But in Psalm 73 verse 17 it says, I didn't understand any of this until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then understood I their end. So it was there he found that all these temporal things that they were paying her were no good and that and the Spirit of God could speak to him. So how does all this reflect with us in building the house of God? We have been now given the place to go into the inner sanctuary. So we we as a high priest by the blood of Jesus can go into the holiest of holies. So just as Asaph could only just touch God in a physical temple, in a physical mountain, and in a physical city to understand this revelation of understanding what the end of the unrighteous be, would be, and the end of the righteous would be. We now too can go into the temple of God and have the Spirit of God come and speak to us because God has given us the privilege to go into the holiest of holies by the blood of Christ. He has torn the temple from the top to the bottom. And if you don't understand, the temple was about 100 millimetres thick. And you, if you tear a curtain, you tear it from the bottom up, but he tore it from the top down, showing that only God could tear such a temple. And that, and that holy place is now open to us. And just as Asaph was beginning to find the true revelation of God was in the temple, we can have the true revelation of God in entering the house that Jesus has made, the, 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 his body being broken, and we can go through his body, which is the veil, into the holiest of holies so that we can now worship God truly in the house that God set up in, in Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, Lord, as we think about building your temple, Lord, as we think about having a place to fellowship, Lord, glory to God, hallelujah. We know that you've set up a heavenly temple. We've, you've set up a heavenly place for us to worship in thee. Lord Jesus, hallelujah. Lord, let us know and understand that these people wrote these things for our admonition upon whom the ends of this age have come. Lord, glory to God, hallelujah. Lord, let us stay holy, Lord. Lord, for you take away that which is holy from those people if they don't appreciate its holiness and give them over to the hands of the wicked, Lord, hallelujah. Lord, we read in Jeremiah, Lord, that because they worship false gods in, in their own land, that we're going to serve strangers in a foreign land. Lord Jesus, you want a holy people. You want to preserve people, Lord, glory to God, hallelujah. You set up a temple to show, Lord, there's a place of holiness to attain to. There's a place of separation. Lord Jesus, that we leave the world to go into the most holy place. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, come to us now. Comfort us. Lead us. Guide us into this thing. In Jesus' holy name we ask. Amen.